The Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Have you ever been like John the Baptist in this gospel text? Have you ever been filled with doubt and uncertainty? Have you ever questioned the meaning of life or your life path? I think that's the sort of mindset I see in John. He's in prison. He realizes that his remaining time on this earth could be quite short. He wonders whether Jesus really is the one that he's been pointing to. Maybe John imagined that the coming Messiah would immediately turn the tables on the violent power structures in the world. And that hasn't happened. Whatever the case, he has his doubts. So he sends his disciples off to ask Jesus directly. Jesus' response to those disciples wasn't simply yes or no. John was still going to have to figure it out for himself. Yet Jesus did Point him in the right direction. Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. These are the signs of the Messianic age, God's healing and reconciling actions in the world. Jesus gives John the data he needs to figure out the answer to his question himself. But how about us? Do we have eyes to see and ears to hear? Jesus was then in a playful mood with the crowd around him about John. He teased them about what they went out in the wilderness to see. He starts with a couple of ruses. A reed shaking in the wind? Were they just curious? Or did they, they go to see someone dressed in soft robes? And Jesus knew that John's wardrobe choices were anything but soft. Once he has loosened them up, he zeroes in on who John was. Yes, John had questions about who Jesus was, but Jesus knew who John was. He even tells the crowd that John was more than just a prophet. He declares him the one that Isaiah spoke of, the messenger sent to prepare the way. And then he throws in that zinger at the end, still bound to give us some whiplash 2,000 years later, when Jesus says that 
John the Baptist was greater than anyone who had yet been born, greater than Moses or Abraham or Elijah or Jeremiah, yet the least in the kingdom of heaven. Now that could even be you or me. The least is greater than he. Now, wow, that's something to sit up and take notice of. Jesus says that this servant way of life, our being the body of Christ and letting God reign in and through us is no small matter. It's a path to greatness, a path to living a life that really matters. And it's not that we in and of ourselves are great. The greatness of which Jesus speaks comes through that participation in God's mission of bringing peace, justice, healing, and reconciliation to our world. This is what Jesus was all about. And this is what Jesus continues to be about in and through us. He continues to transform lives and bring about needed reversals. He continues to give us ears to hear and eyes to see. We've already sung as our psalm today that Magnificat, Mary's song of great reversals, proclaiming how God brings down the powerful from their thrones and lifts up the lowly, and how God fills the hungry with good things and sends the rich away empty. Mary's song about the great things God has done resonates with Jesus proclaiming that the blind see and the lame walk, the deaf hear and the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. So today, as we ponder with John the Baptist whether Jesus is the one, the answer may begin to form as our eyes and ears are opened to God's transforming power at work all around us and in and through us. Yesterday was the anniversary of Thomas Merton's untimely death in 1968. One thing I know about Merton was that he never stopped asking in prayer, who are you, God? Who are you? It's a question that I don't think can ever be fully answered, and yet inevitably keeps drawing us deeper and deeper into the mystery. Maybe John the Baptist wondered about Jesus' identity because he didn't realize how Jesus would bring about change. It wouldn't be with violence, but with love. It happens through us as we join in caring for this earth and working for the changes necessary to provide sustainable, abundant life for all. It happens right here and now through bread broken and wine poured. So may we have the eyes to see and ears that hear. The clues are all around us. Mary sings of the great things that God is doing. Jesus recites his list to John's disciples. Both are about lives being changed. The season of Advent invites us to slow down and pay attention to what God is doing all around us. So take away our blinders, open our ears, bring back to life all those who, who feel dead. The lame will dance, and the poor become rich with the good news of God's abundant love. John O'Donohue shares a story in his book, Eternal Echoes, about an older woman who had been invited to a wedding because she lived next door to the bride. And everyone in that town knew that her husband was mean and controlling. Well, this woman usually didn't drink alcohol, but at the wedding reception, she, she had a few drinks. And it wasn't long until her veneer of reservations began to fall away. The music was playing, but nobody was dancing. So she got up and danced on her own. It was a wild dance. It seemed the music got inside her and set her soul free. She was oblivious of everyone. She took the full space of the floor and used it. She danced in movements that mixed ballet with rock. John wrote that as awkward as it was, there was something magical in her dance. Here she was dancing out 30 years of captive longing. 
The things she could never say to anyone come flooding out in her dance. The onlookers began to shout encouragement, but she didn't seem to hear them. She was dancing. When the music stopped, she returned to her table, blushing, but holding her head high. (coughs) Her eyes were glad, and there was a smile beginning around the corners of her mouth. I imagine in this woman's dance, God healing her in a behind-the-scenes kind of way. Something dead within her was coming back to life. And that's the kind of thing that God loves doing. So how about you? As you look within, where are you in need of healing? What needs restoring? Are your ears deaf to hearing God's word that you are deeply loved and forgiven? (coughs) Is there any part of you that's died and yearns to be brought back to life? Paying attention and becoming aware of our heart's deepest desires. Open us to God's transforming power at work, already in and through us. Thursday evening this week, I gathered with my wife Susan and her family to share the stories about her father, George McVeigh, with the pastor who would preach at her funeral the next at his funeral the next day. My eyes were opened in that hour or so we spent to the loving, healing presence in the tears that were shed, and my ears were opened to God's love and grace at work in George's life, which Pastor Beth crafted into a beautiful homily the next day for me to hear again. What are your ears and eyes open to this day? Some years ago, a Washington Post reporter conducted an experiment to see if people in the normal course of their day might stop and recognize beauty. The ploy was this. A man entered a subway station with a violin case, opened it, tuned up the violin, began playing with the case open before him. It's not that unusual of a a scene at a subway station to see street performers playing for some tips. Some people even stopped to listen for a moment or two, tossing in a buck or a fistful of coins. But most of the commuters just hurried right on past without paying much attention. Yet this wasn't your typical street performer. It was world-class violinist Joshua Bell, who played some of the same pieces he had performed just days before at a sold-out concert with Boston's Symphony Orchestra. What the reporter discovered was that most people walked right on by, not even seeming to hear this amazing, beautiful music that had broken into the midst of their day. So how about it? Do we have eyes that can see and ears that, that hear? Can we see it in the simple joy of a child or the reconciling embrace of friends or lovers? Can we hear it in Mary's song of a world turned upside down? I see it in every act of love and generosity and hear it in every kind spoken word. My seeing and my hearing draws me ever closer as I continue to ponder with John. Are you the one? Or should we wait for another? Amen.